Persistence is the topic of Jesus' parable today and of the way that we want to start our prayer series as we focus on prayer and become better prayers this summer. I, I can give you examples of persistence in my own family just recently, some within the last week, and maybe you'll relate. One example is my wife, Kara, lost one of her favorite hoodies recently, and it, uh, it's a Harley Davidson hoodie, and that makes it special enough, but it was her first Harley Davidson clothing purchase in Texas, which makes it extra special. And uh, we were out a couple, few months ago um, at a restaurant, and uh, after she couldn't find it in the days following that, she kind of put two and two, and she persisted and thought and finally realized, I must have left it at this restaurant. So she went there and talked to the manager and said, hey, do you have a lost and found, and is my hoodie there? No, nope, we don't have a lost and found. Sorry, it's not here. All right, but she didn't give up. So um, it was like a month or so later, and uh, she was back at this place, and uh, she, she decided, she was persistent then. She said, you know, I'm here anyway. I, um, you know, there's, there's another manager here. I'll just ask them. You, you never know. So she says to this different manager, do you have a lost and found? I lost a hoodie. And the manager said, well, absolutely we have a lost and found. And look there, and well, what do you know? Your hoodie is here. You can have it. Here you go. Persistence pays off. One of my two sons was um, bartering with Time Warner about his cable package. And uh, he didn't want TV, didn't want phone, he just wanted internet. You know, all these young kids, they just watch everything on the internet anyway. So that's all he wanted. And he had to go back and forth and make multiple phone calls. And finally, he got a Time Warner cable package deal that he wanted that just had internet on it. There's an example of persistence paying off. And then my youngest son is also now living with us in Texas. He works at Starbucks. And uh, he had to be persistent with his boss back in Wisconsin to transfer him to a, to a Starbucks store here. So he knew in Austin he'd have a job when he moved here. And the boss wasn't doing it, wasn't doing it. And he had to be persistent with him. And finally, after multiple reminders and requests, the boss transferred him. And he's, he's working in the Starbucks store here in Austin now. You may have examples of persistence in your own family or your own life that persistence pays off, doesn't it? So here's my question. If we're so good at being persistent in those areas, why aren't we as good at being persistent in our prayers? Or at least praying more often. Why not? I want to cover a couple of answers to that question this morning and then some encouragement from Jesus as he really encourages us with this prayer or this parable to be uh, more persistent in our prayer life. I read uh, an author this last week who is an American and he was, uh, he was noting something that he read as an observation of an American who was in Iraq in the 19th century. And in Iraq, in the Middle East, in the 19th century, here's what this other author observed, this American. In the village in Iraq, there was a judge or a magistrate. Their title is Qadi. And they sit inside this small hall up on a platform surrounded by pillows. They're the important person and they make decisions about the village that have weight and what they decide goes. And the people who have needs, who uh, need to resolve issues, they know to go to the Qadi to take care of them. And what this observer saw was that there were usually about a dozen people or so during the time that the Qadi was available as the village judge or magistrate. About a dozen people or so wanting their requests to be taken, their issues to be resolved by the judge. Well, if you're one of 12 people, how are you going to get that judge's attention if that judge can only pay attention to one of you at once? You're going to try to scoot to the front of the line. You might make some noise. I don't know, carry a poster. Um, there, so that he saw this racket. There, there was just this noise of people yelling and flailing their arms trying to get the judge's attention. But the people who got the judge's attention weren't the loud people, he noticed. The wise people were whispering behind the scenes speaking to the secretaries or the, these notable people who are serving and helping the judge behind the scenes, whispering in their ears and handing them a little money as a bribe. Here's my request. Oh, and a hundred bucks along with it. 
can the judge now hear my case? And those were the people whose cases were being heard. There was a widow among the twelve who didn't have the money to pay the bribe and she came time and time and time again until finally this judge in this village says, I'm tired of her coming. What does she want? I just, I can't stand her anymore. And she had her case heard and her case was a real case. It was a her son was a, she was a widow. Her son was a soldier who was taken by the king to serve in the military. She had some property. She couldn't run the property. She couldn't till the soil. She couldn't harvest it because her son wasn't there. And the tax man was demanding taxes from her and she couldn't pay them. That was her, ca- her real case. It's a real story. It's amazing how Jesus' parable then relates to that story, isn't it? When Jesus says, there was a widow. And tells us the very similar story in his parable today. And Jesus wants to use a widow to teach us about prayer. And how, how Jesus loves to use the least likely people to teach us things. A widow is the least likely person to have her case heard in front of that judge. She can't afford the bribe. She's, she's, maybe she's weak, maybe small, not as noticeable as a big farmer. And Jesus uses these least likely people. And so he's going to teach us some things about being persistent in our prayers um, that I want to cover through the parable and through the widow today. If you had to answer that question, why you don't pray more persistently, what would you say? I thought about that. Here's a few, here's a few things that I thought about why we don't pray more persistently. Maybe you feel like the widow Lonely, misunderstood, enduring suffering of some kind. And you wonder, does God even care? Or what about this? I think of um, the abuse victim who prays every morning before they get out of bed for protection and for safety. And they, and they wake up and they leave their bedroom either scared about the immediate future or scarred about the past. Or an addict who prays every day, God help me. God heal me. And has to say that same prayer again the next day. And the next day, with apparently no response, is God even there? I think of a parent with a rebellious child who is stepping further and further away and not closer and closer back to home. Jesus values persistence. And you know he values persistence? Just in the same way that a dad puts value on persistence. And maybe he doesn't respond when one of the kids says, Dad. But will respond when the kids say, Kids, are you listening? Say it with me four times. Here we go. Dad, 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 dad. Right? And dad responds. Jesus values persistence because it means we're serious about something. I think the fourth and the the biggest reason we don't pray persistently isn't because we're too busy. Prayer takes time, right? But we fit into our schedules what's important to us. So it's not that we're too busy. It's because we, simple as this, we simply don't believe. We don't pray persistently because we don't believe. And prayer is an act of faith. Um, At the very end of the parable, right? Jesus says, when he comes again, he's talking about the last day. And if there's one thing that's most important to Jesus, he's saying on the last day when I come again, will will the Son of Man find faith on the earth? Jesus asks. That's what's most important, will he find faith? Prayer is an act of faith. I don't pray for magical powers. I don't pray so that my life is more easy. I pray so that I believe more in the work of God in my life. If you are not ready to believe, you are not ready to pray. But if you are ready to believe, God has some amazing things in store for you. And he shows it to you here through the parable. So, there's some things we need to believe then about persistent prayer. 
And the first thing we need to believe is that persistent prayer is okay. So we, we go through phases in our prayer life sometimes and we tend to sometimes not believe that persistent prayer is okay. And here are some reasons why. I'm going to give you four reasons why we don't believe persistent prayer is okay. Number one, who am I to ask God for something? God is almighty and he's holy and he's perfect. Who, who am I to ask for anything? So we don't pray persistently. Or, you know, I'm a little embarrassed. You know, I've kind of neglected my prayer life lately. It hasn't been so good and I don't know if I just want to, you know, kick it up a notch and just go to God when I haven't been praying very well. Or I, there's this need I have, but I just don't know the right words. Those two reasons base prayer in our performance, not where it's supposed to be based on God and his love. And then finally, why I don't persistently pray. You know, I didn't get an answer last time. And I was on my hand. I was just praying. I was on my knees for weeks and I didn't get the answer. So never mind. I'm not going to be persistent in my prayer life. Those are four reasons why we don't pray persistently. We need to believe that persistent prayer is okay. And Jesus gives us these words in the parable, verses 2 and 3. In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him. So you're this widow and you're coming to the judge. Should you, is it okay for you to come to the judge? Uh, you've, you've been observing the judge. You know, he's never tossed anyone out. He's never called security on anyone. He's never um, responded viciously or violently. So you're thinking, well... Uh, okay, I, this would probably be okay. I'll, I'll give it a chance. And you go, and he doesn't answer you as the widow, but he doesn't throw you out either. And so, well, I'll, I'll take a chance. I'll go the next day too. And I'll take another chance. And I'll take another chance. And as the widow, you keep taking a chance. Is that how your prayer is with God? Do you take a chance by approaching God? Is it a risk of any kind? As far as the approach goes, not at all. As far as the answer, yeah, we'll get to that later. But as far as your approach to God, there's no risk at all. So keep coming. Um, I read this in preparing for the sermon this week, and I have to share this to you. This relates to whether persistent prayer is okay or not, and it is okay, and here's why. Listen to this. The platform upon which all true prayer rests this is what makes it go, all right? This is it, is to remember who you are and to remember to whom you are speaking. You are addressing not an admiral or a general, not a president or a superhero, but your father, your heavenly father. You're related to him. He gave you birth and rebirth. He loves you more than you love your own children. And when you pray to him, you're not filling out a, a grant request to a heavenly charitable foundation, you're talking to your father and he loves taking care of his children. So I was listening to a conversation between, between my older son and, uh, and his girlfriend and I'm just, I'm spectating in this conversation and the topic of their conversation is his new job and, and they're kind of walking through how their communication will work during the time when he's at his job. And he's explaining to her, he says, you know, sometimes when you send me a text message while I'm at work, um, sometimes I'll reply, but sometimes I won't. And she says, yeah, I know. And he says, the reason I don't reply is that I know what's going to happen. If you text me while I'm at work and then I send a text back to you, you you're going to take that as a green light for a text conversation. And I, don't, I can't fit that into my work day. It's, I, I, I'm not supposed to do that and I can't fit that in. So there's going to be times, he's telling her, when I text you, and, or when you text me I, and I don't text you back. No hard feelings. I'm not ignoring you, but I just I can't have a conversation. All right, fair enough. There's probably times you've received texts from people too and you haven't responded for that reason. We're limited. We don't have, we don't have everything and all the time. We're limited. Then, my other son, had, uh, he moved here to Texas and he was uh, out on a bike ride and uh, he texted me too. And it was one, one little text message that said, Dad, 
And shortly after that, there was a second text message that said, I. Okay. Um, and now I'm like, what, what are you, what, is this a mistake? Did he miss? And the next text message was, need. Oh, uh, now he has my attention. Not only because he's my son and he, need, he needs something. What does he need? And now I'm waiting for, for the next one. Your. My, my what? My, my time? My, you need to use my vehicle? My, uh, some tool? Help. I, and then 12 text messages later, the message says, Dad, I need your help. I got a flat tire. Now that could have all been in one text message that I might have kind of looked at or not even looked at and ignored, but he knew the, the repeated the repeated text message, dad, 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 got my attention. It did, and I went and picked him up. Now, which of those two stories of my two sons sounds more like Abraham pleading for Sodom? The, don't text me because I may not be able to text you back. Or, uh, dad, 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 right? Doesn't that second one sounds more like Abraham? Not that the first one is wrong. It's just that where people were limited. God's not limited. And so persistent prayer is okay. That's the point. It's okay to go to God. Jesus confirms this in Luke chapter 11, verse 9, when he's teaching the Lord's Prayer. And that's his famous statement when he says to us, Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. And those three letters, A-S-K, form a nice acronym. For A is for ask, S is for seek, K is for knock. And God, your Father, is saying, when you need something, just ask me. When you're looking for direction in your career or guidance in your relationships, seek that direction from me. I'll I'll give you direction. When you have a need, when uh, when you're so ashamed of yourself for your sins, when you need forgiveness, when you hit a brick wall or a dead end, and you just don't, there's no options left. You come to my workshop, you knock on the door, and I'll be there, and I'll answer, and I will have a solution, I guarantee you. That's what God wants. But what if, what if God's solution, uh, how do you say, what if it just doesn't work? I mean, right? What if God's stuff just, It's not going to work, God. Have you ever had anything that God tells you to do through his word, anything that he tells you to do in your life not work? Yeah. I've had a lot of things God tells me not work. And you know whose fault it is? Oh, no, it's it's not my wife's fault. Mine! So it's, so when Everything God does works perfectly. Every answer that he gives you works. It's just right. But it's, it's up to us to apply it. And so we want to be careful there that we don't put the blame on God. So look at Jesus' words. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. He's talking about this judge. He will see to it. God will take responsibility for having the right answer in your prayer life. Um, This is an amazing statement at the end of Genesis 18 um, that Vicar read just previously, the end of that story about Abraham and God and Abraham coming back to God. God, what about, what about, what about, what about? At the end of the story, when it's uh, the exit strategy, go back to Genesis 18. Look at this for yourself. If you don't believe me, here's what it says. When the Lord had finished talking to Abraham, he left. Now, didn't you get the sense in that story that this was all about, that the spotlight was on Abraham and, and how he was coming to God again and again and again and again? And we're, Abraham, whoa, stop. Oh, Abraham, you're crazy. And, and yet, the Bible says, when the Lord had finished the conversation, God was in charge of that prayer conversation, not Abraham. And that's the point. God is in charge of your prayer life with him. And he will take responsibility for giving you just the right answer. Just the right answer. He will get justice. Just means right. 
You will always get the right answer from God. And quickly, according to God's time, he's going to act right away. Now, it's one of four possible answers. You know what the four answers to prayer are? I'm sure you've experienced all of them. The first two are simple. Yes or no. The third is, yes, but let's wait a while. This is a later. This is kind of like what parents say to their kids, right? I'll think about it. All right? So God says, we're going to take some time on this one. I'll get back to you. The fourth is a yes, but I have a better idea. Let's do that instead. And it's, it's a quicker answer, but it's different than what you thought it would be. Those are the four answers to prayer. So be ready for those four. God's ready to give them to you. And any one of them, he guarantees, is just. It's justice. It's just right for what you need. Now, let me give you a hint about those four answers. God's going to weave any of those four answers into not necessarily the circumstances that you want to create by your prayer, but more so into you as his child. So, God wants prayer to change you more so than changing your circumstances. So, be ready for that in your persistent prayers. So I have here up on the projection four scripture references to some persistent prayers that you can look at through the week and serve as models. Um, we have Jacob in Genesis 32. Jacob is wrestling with God. Jacob literally wrestles with God who's in human form and says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. That's how God wants you to pray. And then Exodus 17 is when Moses is holding up his hands when the Israelites are fighting the Amalekites. And when his hands drop, what happens? The Israelite army starts losing. And when his hands go back up, beckoning God's blessing, the Israelite starts winning. And so Aaron on one side and Hur on the other, and they, they hold his arms up the entire time in a persistent way, and the Israelites win the battle. Paul in Colossians, in Colossians in chapter 1 tells the Colossians, you know, ever since I met you, I have been praying about you. That's persistent regular prayer. And then later in Colossians, he tells the Colossians and us, hey, you should devote yourselves to prayer. Kind of like saying, just like I did, all right? Devote yourselves to prayer. Be persistent. Be watchful and thankful, he says. Watch for how God responds to your prayers. And now each of those prayer scenarios change not only circumstances, but change the person praying. Right? God wrenched Joseph's or Jacob's hip, so that the rest of his life he walked with a limp as a reminder that he wrestled with God that changed him, changed his outlook on life and faith. Those hands in the air, Israelites winning, changed Moses as a leader. Paul was changed as a missionary. So God wants to change you by his answers to your prayer. Here's a story that's going to help you remember that. And it relates to the acronym PUSH, P-U-S-H. I'm going to teach you what that means for persistent prayer. There was a man who wanted to improve his prayer life and pray more persistently. So he prayed to God. He said, God, help me learn how to pray more persistently. God said, okay, I want you to go out, go to the hill country, find this big boulder, and I want you to push it. And he's all excited. Okay, I'm going to learn how to pray persistently. I'm going to go there, and I'm going to push this boulder. Oh! All day he pushed with all his might. And it didn't move. And so he went back the next day and pushed. He used his hands and his forearms and he put his shoulder into it and he put his back and he all day he pushed the boulder and it didn't budge. But he was determined. He was persistent. And the next day, and the next day, and weeks went by until finally he had had enough. And one day he, did, he didn't go out to the boulder. He just stopped and he prayed to God. And he said, God, I asked you to teach me about how to pray persistently. I've been pushing and pushing on the boulder and it hasn't moved an inch. And God said, I told you to push the boulder, not to move it. Look at yourself. You have been pushing and exerting for weeks. 
and your arms are strong and your hands are calloused and ready for harder work and your back is strong and your legs are thick and you have learned patience and perseverance and we're still talking. Now, my son, God said, I will move the boulder. That's a great story about the persistence of prayer and finding God's answer. Not always where we're looking. and God wants to change us through that. So the P-U-S-H, here's what it stands for. Pray until something happens. Pray until something happens. And that something may be a change in you or your perspective. Watch for that. Or it may be your circumstances. But pray until something happens. Push. All right, number three. We need not, not only to believe that persistent prayer is okay, not only that persistent prayer works, but persistent prayer is better. Better than what? Better than my way. If I truly believe that God's way is better than my way, I'm going to be very persistent in my prayer life. I'm going to come to him again and again and again knowing that he has the answers and that I don't. There is a way, the Bible says in Proverbs, there is a way that seems right to people, but in the end, it leads to death. So there's a way that we think is right, that I think with my limited wisdom is right, and, and it's not the right way. And God is a better way. Romans 3 says we all fall short of the glory of God. I'm not God. I'm way short of being God. So why would I think that my way is the best way? Instead, I go to Jesus who says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We, we enter God's throne room through Jesus who is the way. Seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus says in his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That's a great package deal when it comes to persistent prayer. So look at these words of Jesus' parable that convince us that persistent prayer is better. Verse 7, Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? What should you do? Cry out to him once a week. No, day and night, persistent. And you can do that because who are you? His chosen ones. See, persistent prayer for you is God's choice first. He opens the door. He sends a text message. Hey, how you doing? Haven't heard from you in a while. Knowing that there could be a conversation and he loves it. Cry out to him day and night. And his answers to you, to your prayers, be watching for this. Whatever the answer, God is most interested in giving you not just the answer to what you're looking for, but giving you himself. Here's a story that illustrates that. I know a family who adopted three little boys. And they are of a different color and a different ethnic background than the family was in the family's community. And the family raised them, the parents raised them, the siblings, with love and care and, and special attention and despite that, these, these three boys kind of had a little hooligan in them and uh, grew up to be in the years of growing from, from elementary, middle, even more so high school, rebellious, uh, kind of smart-alecky, even physically assaultive in their own home to the parents who were giving them this, this new life. And you, you, you could observe the parents and the family giving them tender love and care the whole way through every decision, every little note in the lunchbox, every birthday gift, every special holiday, um, every, every meal made for their birthday, every kiss and hug at night going to bed. Every one of those was just an effort from mom and dad and family to say, we love you so much. And to hope that it would soften their heart and make them understand the love that they had. They didn't need to be cantankerous and rebellious. When I pray persistently and I'm asking and I'm seeking and I'm knocking, 
I'm finding that in his own subtle way, God is asking and seeking and knocking too. With every little guidance, every effort to reach out with his love to soften me and change me. And he's coming to me even as I'm coming to him. You'll experience that in in persistent prayer. So, sum it all up by the very first verse of the, of the parable. I skipped it because I wanted to sum it all up for you. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Jesus doesn't come to you and just say, hey, you slacker, you didn't pray yesterday again, and, right? He, Jesus doesn't beat us over the head. He, God doesn't twist arms. But Jesus woos us by a loving story about a widow with whom we can relate. And in his gentle, loving tones, says, I would love to hear from you again and again and again and again. That's the spirit by which we want to start our prayer series and the way to adjust and improve your prayer life starting this week. So, we're going to do that. We're going to be very practical now. I'm wrapping this up. We're transitioning into the next part of the service, but I need your help to do that. So, that pen that uh, Carmen was so good about giving you today with your worship folder, get that pen, find it right now, or some other writing instrument, and find your connection card. Okay, do this. I'm not talking theoretically. I'm watching you, and I want you to do it. Find your connection card. Be with me there. See, look at Janelle, just like Janelle. She has her connection card. She has her pen. Kara has it ready to go. Here's what I want you to do. At the back of the connection card, the bottom part, it talks about feedback about the service. I want you to write on there the one thing that you you need to pray more persistently about, and you'll do that this week. The one thing. Maybe you haven't been praying about it, or maybe you've kind of been on and off, or have you forgotten about it. And uh, you can offer as much information as you want. The pastors are going to see this, and we look at these, um, and we're happy to pray for you about it too. But we just want, want to see that sampling of what you're praying for, and also be an exercise for you, because you'll remember that now, and it's a great way to start our series. And you pray for that all of this coming week, maybe through our entire series through September, and, and you put God to the test, and you see if his words are true, and you will discover an answer to that persistent prayer. I guarantee you, because God guarantees you, he promises you. So uh, please do that. Put the connection card in the offering basket today, and that'll be good for you, and it'll be good for, for me as your pastor. So uh, thank you for listening. Um, God's blessings on your prayer life. Looking forward to a number of uh, excellent Sundays. Um, Amen. Let's wrap it up and, and pray. Let's fold our hands. Lord Jesus, you have taught us today about persistent prayer, and the best reason we have to do it is because of your heart of love and our Father's desires to hear from us. Bless us in our prayer life to, to pray more persistently and to do that because of your promises, not because of our performance. Thank you for teaching us, for leading us, and guiding us. Uh, we, We come to you now, and we're going to come to you often this week in persistent prayer. Amen.